Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Okay, this is episode 261. I've got a couple cool papers this week. I'm hoping I get to them both, and that's all I really have to say. We're going to get right into the episode. Not a whole lot of anything going on in the news that we haven't talked about on the Masonic Roundtable. Hope you enjoy the last couple pieces we've had up on the Midnight Freemasons. I threw up a couple revisits to some older posts that we had, and I was really excited to put up an interview that we did with the most worshipful Grand Master Tony Krakow of the Grand Lodge of the State of Illinois. So my personal grandmaster from Illinois was uh, really cool and decided to give us some answers to uh, seven questions that Wayne Greenlee came up with, Brother Wayne from uh, Australia, our Aussie correspondent. If you want to read that, check it out on the midnightfreemasons.org and also big shout out to everybody who shared our interview from the Phoenix Masonry website, which we did with Elena, which was great. A lot of you have contacted me regarding the interview and uh, learned some interesting things about me. We kind of put some additional personal details in those interview questions, and uh, I hope you guys liked it, so check it out. And with that, I want to go into the first piece for this week. So the first piece that I have this week is actually an address given before Harmony Lodge number 17 FAAM. That's Free and Accepted Masons. That's, of course, Washington, D.C. It was delivered January 28th, 1914 by Dr. L.D. Carmen, past master, and I'll host this file because it does have an appendix containing the actions taken by the Masonic Grand Lodge of the United States during President Lincoln's death. The title of the address... Abraham Lincoln, Freemason. Now, I know before we get started, there is all kinds of lore about Abraham Lincoln becoming a Freemason, that he either got the EA degree or he didn't, or he pulled back his petition because he didn't want anybody to think he was going after votes. But I've never read this before. Let's see what it has to say. This was printed for distribution in 1914. So here we go. Abraham Lincoln, Freemason. Worshipful Master and Brethren, The subject of my remarks this evening will be Abraham Lincoln, Freemason. It may be regarded as somewhat presumptuous to give this address this title when Lincoln is not considered as one of the Masonic presidents of the United States. And while Abraham Lincoln and Freemasonry might be deemed by some as preferable title, Abraham Lincoln, Freemason, is nevertheless the subject. It was once facetiously attempted to prove that Lincoln was a Mormon because... In one of his early speeches, he made a number of references to throat cutting, the penalty of the first Mormon oath, and because in another address shortly before his first inauguration, he stated that sooner than surrender a certain principle, he would have his body burned to ashes, and those ashes scattered to the winds of heaven, peculiar language in the third Mormon oath. While it has been said that anything can be proved in Masonry, it is not attempted to prove that Lincoln was a member of the secret society called Mormons or of the secret society called Freemasons, but a number of interesting facts concerning Lincoln and his connection with the order are presented for consideration. One of Lincoln's most intimate friends in early life was Bowling Green, an earnest Mason, a past master, and a member of Old Grand Lodge of Illinois. The records of that lodge showing him to have attended the communications of 1826 and 1827. While Lincoln was never formally received into the Masonic Order, he first saw Masonic light in connection with his friendship and close association with Bowling Green. Honor to him who may safely be called the Masonic Preceptor of Abraham Lincoln. It was not an unusual practice in the early days of Masonry in this country in sparsely settled localities remote from Active Lodge for several members of the fraternity to get together, form an emergent or occasional lodge, and make Masons, with no record being made of the proceedings. If Lincoln was not thus made a Mason, he is in some manner obtained considerable Masonic knowledge and probably from Bowling Green prior to 1837, when Lincoln removed from Maynard County, Illinois, to Springfield. When in 1842 Bowling Green died and was buried with Masonic honors, it is somewhat significant that Lincoln was selected by the fraternity to make the address at the funeral, an address he was unable to finish, breaking down with emotion during the delivery. If Lincoln was not a Mason irregularly made, he must have been in sympathy with the known objects of the order to have been invited to speak at a Masonic funeral. 
Clinton Lodge, number 19, at Petersburg, Illinois, was granted its dispensation by the Grand Lodge in October of 1842, and the funeral referred to was evidently under the auspices of the Masons who formed this lodge. As a matter of historical interest to the list of members of Clinton Lodge, 1843 is given, as all the members were acquaintances, if not friends, of the future president. It will be noted that John McNeil, the betrothed of Anne Rutledge, Lincoln's first love, was junior warden. List of members of Clinton Lodge, number 19, Petersburg, Illinois, 1843. John Bennett, worshipful master. Martin S. Morris, senior warden. John McNeil, junior warden. Nathan Dresser, secretary. Jacob West, treasurer. David McMurphy, senior deacon. Worship. B. Kirk, Junior Deacon, Aaron B. White, Tyler, Master Tyler, M.M., John B. Broadwell, and on and on. Prior to 1840, there was a lodge at Springfield, Illinois, which at the organization of the existing Grand Lodge of Illinois in that year became Springfield Lodge No. 4. List of members of Springfield Lodge 1840. At this point, I will not read all those names. I am going to fast forward. If you want to read those names, please download the app and check it out in the bonus features under the downloadable PDF. James Shield, later general and U.S. Senator, was junior warden of this lodge in 1841 and was afterward the first master of National Lodge in this city. As Harmony Lodge is an offspring of National Lodge, we have an indirect connection with the first lodge in Springfield, Illinois, whose members were fellow townsmen of Lincoln, if nothing more. Stephen A. Douglas does not appear in a list of members of Springfield Lodge after 1843. In his younger days, February 22nd, 1842, Lincoln delivered a long lecture on temperance, one of the Masonic virtues. On another anniversary of the birth of that distinguished man and Mason, George Washington, Lincoln delivered a speech on inventions, in the course of which he alluded to the first invention the fig leaf apron, showing his acquaintance with that venerable Masonic claim that Adam was the first Mason as he wore the first apron. Lincoln also had some knowledge of operative masonry. The hammer, square, and compasses were familiar to his hands, and in his early occupation as surveyor, he laid out the squares and calculated horizontals and perpendiculars. Quote, For not by dainty hands in kid the shackles fell to rust, but worthy were the palms that made the nation just. End quote. Lincoln's Masonic Words. References are to federal edition of Lincoln's works. Quote, they were pillars of the Temple of Liberty, and now that they have crumbled away, the temple must fall unless we, their descendants, supply their place with other pillars, hewn from the solid quarry of sober reason. End quote. In a speech about the bank made in 1837 occur the words, quote, Oath of secrecy, divulged a secret. Does not every merchant have his secret mark? Sound the alarm. Another sentence, quote, Such belong not to the family of the lion of the tribe of the eagle. In the Lost Township letter, with composition of which he probably had something to do, occurs the following, quote, I defy Daniel Webster, I defy King Solomon. As this letter was making sport of James Shields, an officer of Springfield Lodge, the sentence may have had more intended significance than would ordinarily appear. Here are some more of his notable Masonic words, quote, I wish to stand erect before the country, will cling to it with a desperate grip, the sharp point against him. If you have ever studied geometry, you remember that by a course of reasoning, Euclid proves that all the angles in a triangle are equal to two right angles, the cements which bind together the different parts of the union, the circle from which all their proportions radiate, charter of freedom, marks another step, our children and our children's children, the word Spot has a peculiar place in masonry, and thus the word affords the basis for the famous so-called spot resolutions introduced by Lincoln in Congress during the Mexican War, December 22, 1847. In his speech at Philadelphia before inauguration, he said that he would, quote, rather be assassinated on the spot than surrender. At the words, fatal blow, though copied, were frequently used in the joint debate with Douglas at Freeport, August 22, 1858. Several times he used the words darkness to light, and in his telegram to General Sherman on his march to the sea, he said, quote, it brings those who sat in darkness to see a great light, end quote. In a letter to Speed, he said, quote, all will be harmony, end quote, a sentiment peculiar to this lodge at least. In speaking of slavery and not of masonry, he once referenced to, quote, blue lodges as they call them everywhere during their secret and deadly work. We are all familiar with that now English classic, the address at Gettysburg, Masonic in every line, 
Note the emphasis. By repetition placed upon the word dedicate, mark the conclusion, government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from this earth. The man who wrote the Gettysburg Address, not a Mason? Listen to these words. Quote, Let us have faith that right makes might, and in that faith let us, to the end, dare to do our duty as we understand it. And having thus chosen our course without guile and with pure purpose, let us renew our trust in God and go forward without fear and with manly hearts, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right. Let us strive on to finish the work we are in. The man who spoke these words, not a mason? With the tinge of a mystic, the inspiration of a prophet, the man who regarded all men as his brethren, that man not a mason? The man who spoke like a mason, lived like a mason, and died like a mason, that man not a mason? No, 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 and a thousand times no. The true Masonic spirit breathes throughout the life of this remarkable man. In 1866, the government published a volume containing the tributes of foreign nations to Abraham Lincoln. In this single volume appear the resolutions and tributes of 44 foreign Masonic Grand Lodges and subordinate bodies. Was Lincoln a Mason to them? Of these 44 lodges, how many called Lincoln brother? Only 20. Here is documentary evidence of a kind. 20 contemporaneous documents concerning our illustrious brother Abraham Lincoln. As the volume referred to is not a rare work, only the list of lodges is here given with such portion of the resolutions as referred to Lincoln as a Freemason. Foreign Masonic Lodges on the Death of Lincoln. Belgium. Septentrion Masonic Lodge of Ghent. Quote, Lincoln personified the cause of liberty and human fraternity. France, a lodge of La French Union at Choisy le Roy, Department of Seine, quote, We mourn the loss of a brother whose memory will ever be dear patriots and Freemasons. He honored Masonry, end quote. From this date, the name of Abraham Lincoln is inscribed on the list of our members, and at each session for three months, a brother will rise at the call of his name and answer, Abraham Lincoln died like a Mason to elevate humanity, outraged by slavery. At the expiration of three months, we will celebrate a Masonic funeral in his memory. Perfect Union Masonic Lodge, Orient of Confolius, Charent, New Friendship Lodge of Grace, Grisse, quote, sympathy for the glorious death of one who, after having used the hammer square, encompasses those living implements of our immortal society, etc. United benefactors of Gentilly to the Grand Lodge of New York. The very illustrious brother Abraham Lincoln has given his life for the love of his country, etc. Thus setting the most noble example of a Masonic brother can give to his brethren. Freemasonry has suffered an irreparable loss. End quote. Orion Lodge of St. John's, Gaelic Orient. Lodge of Toleration and Progress in Lure. Quote, sympathy for the memory of Brother Lincoln. La Escole de la Morale Lodge of Libourne. Quote, Lincoln, our illustrious brother. Quote, Lodge will mourn for three months. End quote. The Lodge of Les Arts Runis Orient of Masson. The glorious martyr of equality and fraternity. Friends of Truth Lodge in Metz. Lodge of St. John in Jerusalem and Nancy. The great Masonic Association that glorified in calling Mr. Lincoln one of its own children. Clement Friendship Lodge, Paris. Quote, we Masons mourn him not only as a brother, but as a friend of the whole human race. Lincoln's first thought was the Mason's motto, fraternity. Lodge of Triumphant Friends in Paris. Chapter of Mars and the Arts in Paris. A stronger bond, a more intimate union than the common tie united us, particularly to his great heart. Abraham Lincoln was our brother. The sovereign chapter of the Friends of the Country, Valley of Paris, quote, Glory to our brother Lincoln who practiced the virtues inculcated by our order and who Masonry is proud to number among the number of her children. Lavenir Lodge, Paris. Regret for the death of brother Abraham Lincoln. Scotch Masonic Lodge, La Provence, Paris. St. John's Lodge, number 147, Heroes of Humanity. Quote, All Freemasonry mourns the death of Abraham Lincoln. And this lodge also regrets the loss of a man who was an honor to our order, etc. Ancient accepted Scottish Rite, Paris, quote, Lincoln, whom we had the honor to count among our brothers. Lodge of Henry IV in Paris, Perseverance Lodge, Paris, quote, Has any living man practiced so well the humane principles inculcated by Freemasonry and who is more deserving of the regard of the regrets of their brethren? Lodge ordered a triple morning salute in memory of Brother Lincoln. 
Lodge of Admirers of the Universe in Paris, quote, the memory of Brother Abraham Lincoln, end quote. Scotch Hive Lodge in Paris, quote, Freemasonry is moved with just indignation at the atrocious crime that has deprived it of one of its most illustrious representatives. Condolence for the loss of the zealous Mason who has proclaimed the great Masonic principles of liberty, equality, and Freemasonry, and fraternity. Memory of the very illustrious brother Abraham Lincoln. Lodge of St. John of Jerusalem, Paris to Grand Lodge of New York. Quote, the glorious death of one who had handled the hammer, square, and compasses. Harmony Lodge of Paris. Lodge St. Pierre de Acacius, Paris. Quote, Brother Abraham Lincoln, member of the Grand Lodge of New York. Quote, death of their brother, Abraham Lincoln. Lodge of the Fraternity of the People, Paris. The horrible outrage to which Brother Lincoln has fallen a victim. Scotch Lodge number 146, the right line. Quote, the crime, etc., deprives masonry of a brother. Right of Mizraim, Supreme Grand Council, Lodge Rasson. All the virtues possessed by Lincoln are Masonic virtues symbolized in our degrees of initiation. When an apprentice has purged his mind of all the subversive passions, which was an indispensable preparation for the good conduct of life, as a companion he had learned to live order by labor and a scrupulous observance of right and justice, a course which was marked out by rule square and compasses. Finally, like Hiram, he succumbed to the blows of an outrageous pride for having remained inflexible in the discharge of his duty. End quote. Lodge of St. Augustus, beneficent to the Grand Lodge of New York. Quote, First, the son of laboring man, he was an apprentice. Then he became a journeyman, and last, a master, thus realizing the Masonic symbols. End quote. Cradle of Henry IV Lodge in Pau. Friends of Perfect Union Lodge, Perpignan. Quote, an illustrious Mason, the very dear brother, Abraham Lincoln. Our very illustrious brother, Abraham Lincoln. Royal Scotch Lodge, the elect of St. Stephen. Lodge of Good Faith, St. Germain in Ley. The Gazette de France. May 5th, 1865, spoke of Abraham Lincoln as of the Grand Lodge of New York. On page 124, the Grand Lodge of Freemasons of Ireland, Grand Lodge of Freemasons of Scotland, and England. Lodge of Gymnosophists in London, quote, Abraham Lincoln, member of the Grand Lodge of New York, end quote. Italy, Social Progress Lodge, Florence Lodge, and Ziani, Virtuosi, and Leghorn. The list goes on and on and on, guys. You can read all of them, but it's it's really insane that all of these other lodges come together, and every one of these quotes that I'm talking about in this paper regards Lincoln as a member of the Grand Lodge of New York. So what's going on here? Let's continue. It will be noted that there are several references in these resolutions to Abraham Lincoln, member of the Grand Lodge of New York. It is possible that this error arose from the fact that this Grand Lodge participated in the funeral ceremonies in New York City as the Grand Lodge and other Masonic bodies in the several states through which Lincoln's body was carried on its way from Washington to Springfield took part in the ceremonies in their states. The Grand Lodge of New York, however, was unaware that Lincoln was a member of that lodge or any other as the DGM of that jurisdiction on April 19, 1865, the day of mourning, addressed a letter to Brother B.B. French of Washington, which was answered as follows. From Masonic Monthly, May 1865, page 351, Office of the Grand Master of Knights Templar of the United States of America, City of Washington, April 21st, 1865. Right Worshipful Robert D. Holmes, Deputy Grand Master, Grand Lodge of New York, My dear sir and Right Worshipful brother, yours of the 19th is just received. President Lincoln was not a Freemason. He once told me in the presence of most worshipful brother J.W. Simmons that he had at one time made up his mind to apply for admission to our fraternity, but that he feared he was too lazy to attend his duty as a Mason, as he should like to do, and that he had not carried out his intentions. I told him that it was not too late now. Well, quote, said he, as likely as not I shall apply to you some day to let me in. He was the most pure-hearted, honest, upright man I ever knew, and ought to have been a Mason. Had he been my own father, I could not have lamented his death more sincerely than I do. Very truly and fraternally yours, B.B. French. An examination of the transactions of all the Grand Lodges of the United States in existence in 1865 shows some reference by the Grand Master to the death of Lincoln or some action by the Grand Lodge of the following jurisdictions. 
Connecticut, District of Columbia, Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, Maine, Massachusetts, Nevada, New Hampshire, New York, Ohio, Wisconsin. As would be expected, no notice of the death of the president was taken by any southern state, but their transactions for 1865 afford pathetic reading of tales of fire and sword. Other Grand Masters and Grand Lodges occupied themselves with matters of Masonic routine only. These actions of Masonic Grand Lodges of the United States upon the death of Lincoln have not until this time been brought together. Comparison has been heretofore made between Abraham Lincoln and one of the first most excellent Grand Masters in his virtuous and amiable conduct in his unfeigned piety to God and his inflexible fidelity to his trust, the Hiram who was also slain, and like him his memory is not dimmed by the passing years. So that's the paper. I know it was a little bit long there in the middle where we were talking about all the places in which Abraham Lincoln was actually addressed as a Freemason. We cleared up the fact that it was a simple mistake. These Grand Lodges of foreign jurisdictions heard and saw that Grand Lodge of New York was obviously involved in his funeral and several lodges across the United States were helping out when the body of Lincoln was being toured around like so much traveling circus. If you don't know, Lincoln's body traveled for a really, really long time everywhere, guys. I mean, in fact, his body was the subject of theft and all kinds of uh, wild and crazy things. Uh, you really should uh, look into it if you haven't. It's absolutely fascinating. Uh, if you don't know, Abraham Lincoln is, of course, uh, my favorite president of all time. I love the mystique about the man and the myth. And uh, you've heard me say on the show before, if you've ever listened to past episodes where we've talked about Masonic presidents and wishes. I always wished that Abraham Lincoln was a Freemason. I think, in fact, uh, Brother Todd E. Creason even addressed that in a Midnight Freemason post some time back, uh, Abraham Lincoln Freemason or not, and he came to the same conclusions that uh, Abraham Lincoln was not a Freemason. Of course, going into this paper, I was really hoping that it would be proven he was, or at least shine some additional light that would possibly give some credence to the idea that maybe he at least was an EA or something. Unfortunately not. Maybe in an alternate universe, things were different. Now that paper took about 20 minutes or so to read. Um, I should say there's probably another 20 minutes to it if we decided to read the appendix. I'm not going to do that. However, I will definitely put that paper in the show notes so that you guys can all check it out and use it for some research of your own. Uh, get a little bit of history out of it. It's pretty darn cool. So the next piece that I have for you guys that I wanted to read was actually an excerpt from The Arcana of Freemasonry, which is a fantastic book, lots of great information. However, there is so much interesting content, and I really wanted to read you guys chapter four, which is about the divine word. As most of you know, I have a fascination with that. And the book is by Albert Churchward, medical doctor, MRCP, FGS, past master, and PZ. There's a fully illustrated PDF doc that I really wanted to read. It was first published in 1915. And there's just too many translated words. There's too many words of different cultures and languages in the chapter. And I don't think that it would do it justice to read it. And because of that, what I think I would love to do is I will try to include a link to the book in the show notes. And of course, the paper that we read previously will be in the actual episode bonus features. There's a great number of books listed from this website, and I'll try to feature one every other week or so. We'll see what we can do about it. But this book, The Arcana of Freemasonry, is pretty darn cool. It kind of addresses Freemasonry globally. In fact, one of the first illustrations in the books looks like a Mayan depiction. So I will definitely put a link to that in the show notes. And if you guys want to check out chapter four, and maybe we can talk about it a little bit on the Twitter or Facebook feeds. And we'll see what you guys might want to talk about. So with that, I think we're going to call it for this week. I really hope you guys had a great Labor Day weekend last week. I hope you guys tune in to the Masonic Roundtable coming up. We've got a wonderful show coming up about the history of Prince Hall Masonry, which is a history that is not known by many. And this guy has really done his research. I believe he's got a new book out. So don't miss the show on Tuesday. Prince Hall Masonry, I believe it's about African Lodge number one. And that'll be episode 133. So uh, thanks again for listening to this show and for listening to TMR, the Masonic Roundtable, reading the blog Midnight Freemasons, and really just pushing Masonic education to the forefront of our lodges and demanding it. Uh, that's what we're supposed to do, 
and somewhere along the way I think it kind of fell off and uh, I'm glad it's coming back. Um, Our efforts are really paying off and I salute each and every one of you who is sharing articles and and reading them. And even if you never share an article and you never donate to the show, the fact that you might be gleaning some of the knowledge that we're putting out there and being able to talk about these things with fellow brothers, maybe it's just... uh, you know, neat little nuggets of information you might be giving out, uh, whatever the case may be. Maybe we inspire you to write a paper or something really cool. I really can't thank you guys enough for everything you're doing for the fraternity. I get a lot of notes that say, you know, RJ, thanks so much for everything you're doing, you know, with the shows and the blogs and all this stuff. But, you know, I'm just one guy doing one thing. You guys are the people who are sharing it and taking these into lodges and making the real difference. So if you want to thank somebody, look in the mirror, point at yourself and say thank you. Or at least let me tell you thank you. Uh, You guys are amazing and you're doing a great job. If you want to support the show, please do check out our support the show section on the website www.wcypodcast.com. Click on support the show, buy a pin. Um, I'll send them out. I try to get all the shipments out. I send everything out every Saturday morning. So I take orders all week and everything goes out on Saturdays. Uh, So if you're so inclined, check it out. And with that, I'll talk to you all next week. Stay on the level. For Whence Came You, I'm Robert Johnson. You've been listening to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition. 